Okay, so so thank you everyone for, for attending this session on Das Boot. Uh, as I like to say, diving into debugging Spring Boot applications. Um, <laughs> a little aside before I go any, any further with this, I used to give a, a colleague and a good friend, dear friend of mine, a hard time about the, the, the horrible boot puns. Uh, beautiful this, beautiful that. I said, you'll never catch me doing that. Uh, and of course, anytime you say that, you know you're going to break <laughs> break your word. Uh, so of course, I, I did this, but I feel like if you if you have multilingual puns, it's somehow better. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm looking out to you, my, my German peeps, to, to tell me this is okay. But anyway, <laughs> so das Boot, das Boot, however you want to go with it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of flow with this. Uh, but, but yeah, we're going to dive into debugging Spring Boot applications. Ah, good stuff. Good jokes. Anyway, my name is Mark Heckler. I am a principal cloud advocate of Java and JVM languages with Microsoft. Uh, yeah, I used to be on the Spring team. I was at Pivotal. I was v at VMware. Uh, and Microsoft lost the coin toss, so now I'm there. I'm kidding. I still work with Spring extensively. Uh, Microsoft is is focused on making Azure the target of choice, regardless of what you use. So whether that's uh, OS, tool chain, language, doesn't matter. Uh, so I get to work with a lot of the same great tooling, uh, the same great libraries, the same great software that I did before. I just uh, get a, perhaps more uh, more you know, more and varied toolbox uh, for deployment. So <laughs> anyway, if you want to uh, reach out to me after the fact, uh, obviously we'll be taking questions and answers as we go, or questions throughout. I'll try to answer those at the end. If you think of something uh, 10 minutes after the fact, uh, let's see. So looks like I've got a breakout room thing here. I guess I canceled that. Um, but if you if you think of something to ask after the fact or a question, comment, or feedback you want to toss my way, uh, that's what always happens to me too. I think of it after I leave, after the session's over. Uh, by all means, do reach out to me. My emails are good, but my Twitter is better. Uh, my DMs are open, so if you just happen to shoot me a DM, if, if we haven't connected yet, I'll still see it. I'll still be able to respond. So with that, let's let's launch in. Uh, oh, it took two. Uh, Two, uh, two advances are better than one, I guess. A bit about me, I am an architect and developer by background. I'm also an advocate, obviously. Uh, I often tell people that the developer advocacy is almost in many cases an accidental career field uh, because you are a developer first and then you share information and you share a bit more and then all of a sudden, somehow through some magical uh, transition or mystical transition, you become an advocate. Uh, I always say that advocacy allows me to combine the two things that I love to do most, code and talk, uh, so I get to talk about coding while I code a lot of times. So um, yeah, it's a it's a good gig. Uh, I am an author. I have co-authored several books, contributed content and code to several others. Uh, even solo authored a book, which again, I like uh, like puns. I swore I would never do, and yet here we are. I'm a Java one rock star, uh, Java champion, Kotlin developer expert, all the the good things, I guess. Uh, also, I licensed an instrument rated pilot, uh, which is good to literally change your perspective on the world. So <laughs> with that. <laughs> Uh, the latest book, I, I swore, and I co-authored a couple of books with good friends and, and just dear friends and had a great time, but realized really quickly that it was a lot, a lot of work. And I swore, geez, I'm never going to do that by myself because as much work as it was, even with a good group of folks, you know, pitching in and getting it done together, wow, that would be just a massive undertaking by yourself. So of course the pandemic hit and I thought, ah, why not write a book? <laughs> so I wrote this book. It came out uh, last year. Uh, still very, very relevant and will be going forward because I tried to make this as future-proof as you can. Obviously, versions change, but but the concepts don't. And this is an introduction to building cloud-native Java and Kotlin applications using Spring Boot. Uh, if you want to know more about it, visit the uh, bit.ly link or follow the, boot, the, the Spring Boot book on Twitter because the book also is on Twitter. Everyone's on Twitter, right? <laughs> so the plan for this morning, this afternoon, whenever you're watching this, I love a good quote, and this one's by Leonard Bernstein, a former conductor and a composer, a uh, former conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra several years ago. He said, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. And they wouldn't give me more than 50 minutes today for this session. I actually will, will, may see you again later, but, uh, but for this session, we're, we're limited to 50, so we're going to move through pretty rapidly and hopefully not too rapidly. But again, we have uh, spillover time should we need it after the fact with on Twitter, uh, DMs, emails, et cetera. So a quick overview. Now, I've given this talk a grand total of, I think, three times, and each time it's a little different. Uh, I keep trying to add in and tweak and, and think, wow, this would be really good to, to add to the conversation. Uh, but of course, anytime you add something, you have to remove some things. So, so the, the content shifts a bit. 
but I think I've got a pretty good balance here today. And because I, the, the title is debugging, diving into debugging, but debugging not in the strictest sense, uh, because debugging, <laughs> of course, get a phone call right now. Uh, debugging doesn't just mean uh, working through step-by-step -step in, in a debugger in your IDE. Uh, that's part of it, but it's very important to get to the underlying cause. I, I like to talk about root cause analysis. When you have a problem with your, your application, uh, you may use a debugger to find that. You may actually use other tools to find out not just the what, but sometimes the why. Why did this happen? Why? Where did this value come from? How did this get reset? How did this change? Uh, and, and in many cases, you have to go beyond what would be uh, just a trip into your local IDE's debugger. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a lot more. I think it's very important. I know it's very important to understand kind of the, the context that you're dealing with when it comes to a Spring Boot application. Uh, so we'll talk about application startup, a little bit about bean initialization and configuration. We will get into debugging local apps via IDE in just a bit. Uh, I, I think that's actually the, the easiest part of the whole, uh, the whole landscape, but, but we'll talk about that. We'll show that a little bit. Uh, we'll dig into Actuator for some additional insights for, for adding clarity to the conversation. Uh, we'll see Sleuth and Zipkin for tracing interactions because so much of our lives are not spent in these, uh, these, these insular monoliths anymore. I mean, we do still use them. They are still out there. They'll probably be out there for, for years to come. Uh, but, but many times we're dealing with uh, interactions between services and we want to be able to deal with those as well. And should time permit, uh, we'll get into debugging remote, app, remote applications, which is kind of an extension of the debugging local apps. So we'll see. Uh, so this, <laughs> you may recognize this, this is like a day in our lives, right? In many cases. Uh, so many times we're the person here in the front holding the burning loaf of bread and our managers riding by on the ostrich, just ask for minute by minute updates. When can we get production back online? <laughs> Uh, and, and when you get in these crisis type situations, it's very easy to apply the quick fix. And, and you know, if you can do that to buy yourself time to find the underlying problem and fix it, that's great. Many times we can't. And, and therefore, you have to really slow things down in order to speed things up, right? You slow things down a bit, find the underlying cause and fix it for good. Many times I, I hear people say, well, you know, junior developers, they just, you know, aim for the quick fix and get it out. Well, we, we senior developers fall into the same issue a lot of times, sometimes for different reasons, uh, because maybe we've seen a similar situation develop a dozen times, two dozen times, and we immediately short circuit our, our analysis process to, well, this fixed it la the last five times, so this will fix it this time. And maybe we get lucky. Maybe we don't. Maybe we just waste more time by trying to apply a quick fix and actually trying to solve a symptom versus the underlying problem. So let's let's step back today and maybe look at some actually how to solve the problems. Boy, I don't know what it is about fire. <laughs> but let's dive into the code. Hopefully it won't end like this. We'll, we'll see. I'm going to exit this and we'll go uh, back here. I'm going to start off by creating a single Spring Boot application. And by the way, I want to keep the domain just crazy simple, ridiculously, stupidly simple so that we can focus on the things that I want to show versus, you know, getting kind of distracted with a great domain. I love a great domain. I love great data, live data. But but right now for this, I want to keep it dead simple so we can look at uh, the things that I want to look at versus the, the, the interesting data that might be flowing through our system. Uh, I will, again, with uh, when we talk about Sleuth and Zipkin, add a second service, but we're going to keep that very simple as well. Uh, so again, the, the, the goal is to focus on the important stuff, not on, on the urgent, so to speak. So I'm going to just change this, uh, the hecklers.com for the group. I will be using, again, fairly straightforward things. So the build system will be staying with Maven, language Java, current version of Spring Boot. Again, nothing fancy. We're going to keep this as, as close down the middle as we can. And I already see I have typos. So <laughs> uh, this will be a great, uh, great start. So I'm going to call this Das Boot, right? Artifact or Das Boot, should you prefer. Uh, we'll, we'll mix up the, the languages and metaphors and, and the puns all, all day. Why not? I'm going to use the standard JAR packaging uh, and Java 17, and uh, we'll add some dependencies. Again, this works pretty much the same anyway, but, but we're going to keep it uh, right down the middle here. Uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Reactive Web for a dependency and web because I'm going to keep this, again, very in the imperative world. I don't want to bring in the reactive world. Again, keeping it as simple as possible for the purposes of our, our demo here. Uh, and then I'm going to include actuator. Uh, and then I also want to bring in a dependency for Spring Cloud Sleuth so we get our distributed tracing via logs. 
And I'm going to bring in the Zipkin client so we can see what's going on, the distributed tracing. I have Zipkin uh, running in the background so we can take a look and visualize some of our traces as we go. So let's generate our project, our first project. I'm going to just dump this on my desktop and unzip this. And what happened? <laughs> It just went away. Well, that's interesting. All right, so there we go. To quote uh, one of my favorite scientists, "What's life without whimsy?" Right. So let's uh, let's do that, and let's open this up. <clears throat> interesting. Why did that do that? All right. Um, well, you know, it's going to be an interesting day. We'll, we'll find out. We'll see if this works. <laughs> if not, well, we'll always think it should have, right? So I'm going to close that. I'm going to close this window and close. Why is that coming up that way? Let's, uh, that's an interesting, interesting uh, diversion by IntelliJ. So let's go to our POM. Uh, and our POM, I just make sure this looks right because it started off kind of weird there. Uh, so we have actuator, we have a starter web, starter web flux. I'm bringing in web flux so I can get our reactive web client. That's the preferred way of interacting with another service. Uh, and I will be doing that eventually as with Zipkin and Sleuth. Uh, that's not so much a crisis right now, but we will get to there. Uh, I'm going to go to the application properties. Uh, and just because I'll, I know I'm going to need them later, I'm going to define my spring application name. This is Das Boot and my Zipkin name, service name. Uh, once again, we'll call this DOSBO. Why not? Uh, and then I'm going to leave this on the default port of 8080. That only matters when we add the second service. And then I want to add another thing. I'm going to open up our actuator endpoints by doing this. Now, I do always do, <laughs> add the comment, please do not do this in production. Because with actuator, uh, typing is a thing. Uh, with actuator, it, by default, well, we'll come back to this. I will just comment this out for now. By default, it only shows a health endpoint, right? Well, a couple of variations on that. But but ultimately, what we want for our demo is to be able to see it all. So I will uncomment this at some point, but not now. So let's get started. If we take a look at our Spring Boot application, uh, this looks fairly innocuous, right? If we if we omit this, we just get rid of this uh, this annotation. This looks a lot like a standard Java application. Now we're doing a Spring application run, so we are passing our app main application class and the arguments to something else here. But but a public static void main with a an, a string array of arguments looks pretty common Java. There's not a lot that's crazy unique here, right? So if we look at this application, we probably think, wow, that must there must be a lot of magic in there. <laughs> Has anybody ever heard that, you know, there's there's just a lot of magic going on in Spring Boot applications? Yeah, I, I always really, really bristle at that because it's not magic, it's logic, right? I, I always look at this and go, well, you know, it's science, it's technology, it's engineering, it's, I suppose there's some mathematics in there too. I mean, it's STEM. There's no Harry Potter stuff in here. It's all logic. So So let's drill into this. Let's dive into this, if we will, and see what this this magical annotation has. It's not just an annotation. If I do a command B in IntelliJ, we see that uh, really there are three main annotations here that this uh, that, that, that form the, the bulk of our Spring Boot application in a meta annotation. So we have the Spring Boot application is also a Spring Boot configuration. If we look here, we can see that yes, uh, well, I this, We'll just we'll go on from here. I, I wanted to show something, but it kind of short circuits that as I say it, and I want to I want to do that myself. Right. So so it includes the annotation for Spring Boot configuration. So if we drill into that, if we dive into that, we see that it is an alias for a configuration, right? So it's an alias. Spring Boot configuration is an alias for configuration. And if we dive into configuration, we see that that is an alias for what? Component. So this tells us right off the bat that any class that's annotated with at Spring Boot application is a Spring Boot configuration class, which means it's a configuration class, which means it's a component, which tells us two things. A configuration class allows us to define bean creation methods. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, that is a method that will create a, an object of a certain type 
as a spring bean and place that within our application context, sometimes referred to as our inversion of control container, a dependency injection container, or colloquially as the bean bucket, right? So if we create a method like at bean, this means, hey, create a bean of type something, right? We'll say create something. This is our create something method and we'll return, oops, we'll return a new something. No, not that. Something. All right. Now, all we need now is just a class something, and we're off to the races, right? So this will create, and I'll go ahead and do this here. Let's uh, let's let's do this. So um, public public something something, and we'll just print this out. Um, and I like to make this very visible. So this is really something. Now. By doing this, if I run this, what will happen is, uh, since this is a configuration class, it will create, it, we can create a bean of type something, and it will spin this up, and we'll just see the evidence of that in our startup. So yeah, this is really something. If we really want to set this off next time around, what I'll do is just uh, do this, so. But, um, I mean, we have the code for our something class. So you don't typically do it this way, but you could, right? So what we can also do, what I like to do, and I, I am short circuiting a little bit here because typically what I, what most people do in real code is they'll they'll separate their classes into separate files, which is good practice. You know, I'm just kind of short circuiting that just a bit, but I'm going to create a configuration class. This will be our uh, DOS boat config, right? And I'm going to drop that here. This is a configuration class. It will do exactly the same thing as placing this bean creation method up here. And of course, uh, and I, I don't want to get ahead of myself too much, but we can see that this works. This is really something. Uh, but we can also uh, change this out. And instead of doing this, we can just define this class something as a component. And since we have the code right here, this kind of makes sense. We're defining this as a component. Please make this into a spring bean and place this in our container. And life goes merrily along. Works the same way, same exact way. So again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so I'll do a callback here shortly. So that kind of covers the Spring Boot configuration annotation. Uh, and just to, to highlight one more thing, the fact that our, our main application class is a Spring Boot app, Spring Boot configuration class means that it is both a component and you can create beans in that. So right now, as it stands, we have two beans that we have created, either intentionally or just by virtue of having a, a Spring Boot application. One is this, we have a something bean, and two is this application bean, DOS Bolt application is a bean, is, is a component that's created and placed into our, uh, into our inversion, or inversion of control container. So by virtue of having this annotation, we get both. Now I'm gonna skip over enable, add enable auto configuration, go to our component scan, because this ties into what I just showed. Uh, component scan, you can customize, you can have it just search certain packages. Uh, you can have it uh, search by class name or classes specifically, but generally speaking, if you don't do anything is, you know, to change it, what it does is it will look for any at component or alias. Uh, so things like at controller, at service, um, uh, at rest controller, uh, uh, at repository, uh, it will look for anything with those annotations in this package, the current package, in this case, com.theheckler's.dasboat. And it will look for any annotated class uh, with a component-based annotation, uh, and it will create a component of that type and place that within our application context as well. So, and there are various reasons you might want to limit that, but generally speaking, you don't. You want that to look in your application, main application package on down. Uh, so that handles that for us, which is a very nice uh, add-on feature as well. Let's go back up to our at enable auto configuration. And I am moving through this rather quickly, so I'm kind of leaving off some things. Uh, but again, happy to expand on this offline after the fact, if you'd like. So the auto configuration is really where people feel it, Spring Boot is, is the most jarring. Jarring, yeah, yeah, that's good stuff. I, you'll get it, you'll get it eventually. I, I'm kidding, you probably already have gotten it. And yeah, it's good, right? So anyway, what does auto configuration mean? And, and there are a couple of things that I wanna show you in accordance with this, but ultimately what I wanna do or beginning with is to look at our POM because the parent for our, our application's POM is Spring Boot Starter Parent. And if I dive into that, we see that the parent for that POM is Spring Boot Dependencies. And just to give you a quick taste of this, and there's much more to it, 
uh, with the spring factories and whatnot. But I kind of want to give a, a quick introduction and then move on from here. So at least you, again, have context. So at the top of this file, we see that there are many different uh, libraries with versions. And then if you go on down, I'm going to skip ahead a bit. We see that these are various, the same various different libraries, and of course, some Spring libraries as well. So if you go back to our original POM, you see that nothing here has a version number. And that's because everything is version synchronized based on dependencies that are, are known, that are widely tested with this version, in this case, 2.7.3 of Spring Boot. So these are not all dependencies that are included in your application. These are evaluated for potential inclusion in your application for auto configuration. How extensive is auto configuration? Again, I'm skipping a lot of things here, but we will come back to that in a moment and you'll see kind of all the work that your Spring Boot application does in your build and then ultimately executes when you start up your application. It's quite a lot and it does it on your behalf, on my behalf when we start up our app. So let's drill in or dive in a little bit more to our Spring application, um, our, our, our the thing that kicks it off, right? Our Spring application.run. So I'm gonna drill in or dive into this method we see that this is a static method. Uh, we dive in further and we see that it actually, oh, let's see, go into there. And we see that ultimately what it does is it calls spring application dot run. And let's take a look at that method. And we see, I, I wanna come back to the top here in a moment, but ultimately what happens is just a quick summary is we get a timestamp because what happens on your startup is that of course it gives us very nice uh, banner, which you can turn off or on. Uh, and then it it starts off and gives you, by the time it's all said, kind of a play-by-play, a -play, but at the end, it, it will tell you how long it took to initialize your application uh, and then uh, how long the JVM has been running. So it does this by grabbing a timestamp. It starts up the, uh, creates the bootstrap context. Uh, it does a few other things through here. It gets the run listeners. It indicates that they're starting. It processes application arguments. It prepares the context. Oh, I skipped the most important part here. It prints, prints the banner. Uh, and then it goes on to prepare the context, uh, do a few other things, report the, uh, the time taken to start up. And then it calls the application and um, application runner, command line runner. Again, there's a lot more that can be said about this. There's just no time. So I'm going to back out of this now. Oh, I do want to say one thing. Because in this run method, it returns what? A configurable application context. Now, what happens to that? Where does it go? Uh, well, it's it's right here. What I like to do is show right the right here that we have our context there. Oh, of course. Let's see. Context. And, and we can do things with it. Most of the time we don't, right? But we can, in this case, get our environment. I'm going to get the system properties. And then for each, I'm just going to uh, do my key and value. Uh, and I'm just going to print those out, right? So key and plus K plus value plus V. All right, so if we print this out, we just run this, we can see that we can do things with that context, but generally speaking, again, we don't, we don't need to. And, and the one thing I like to show with this is why in some cases you don't really need to do this. We can see that we've got quite a few values that are showing up, useful values, right? The Java vendor, the JVM uh, version, file encoding, line separators, the OS name. We've got our environment here, uh, well, uh, farther here. Uh, we've got our Java class path. We've got quite a bit of stuff here that's, that's eh, marginally useful, but it's available in other ways. So you typically don't see this done. We won't be doing this past today, but again, I think it's useful to see what's what's happening. So let's see, what do I want to do next? Well, uh, let's talk about our bean initialization and config. I guess we kind of already did that, so I'll, I'll move on to the next thing, which is how can you see some of the things? Uh, if you have issues, if you have questions on why something is spinning up the way it is, um, well, let's, let's, let's go back first and show one more thing uh, here. Uh, screen application. There we go. So I'm just going to just set a breakpoint here. Uh, and again, I'm going to hitting hit the debugger very lightly, but I do want to show kind of how it comes into being and, and some very useful things. I'm going to restart this. And just in initialization, we'll, we'll stop this and take a quick look at our context. <coughs> Pardon me.
All right. So I will zoom in on this here in a moment. I just need to navigate here for a moment. So I'm going to drill into the context and then I'm going to go into the bean factory. Now, before I do that, remember how many beans we intentionally uh, created one and how many beans that were created on our behalf simply by, by, uh, by benefit of the at Spring Boot application annotation one, right? So we know there are gonna be two beans that are created for us as a result of our efforts or just the, the fact that it's a Spring Boot application. But if we dive into this a bit, we can see that we've got maybe just a few more, let me zoom in on this, maybe just a few more than those two that we might have expected. So we have 485 beans that have been created due to auto configuration. And that seems a lot, right? That seems excessive, except uh, Spring Boot, uh, again, the logic, its auto configuration has said, look, you have certain things on your class path, you have certain things in your code, minimal things in our code at this point, uh, but your, your annotations, your, your application, your class path have, have been taken into account to determine what you might need for your application. For instance, we included Actuator. There are a certain number of beans that are provided to provide metrics and health information and things of that nature. Uh, we included Sleuth, we included Zipkin client. So there are things that must be in place for us to use those unless we wanna handcraft each of these things, which is a lot of work. And, and coming from the Java E world, as most of us have, uh, when we come to Spring, it does feel a little jarring, no pun intended this time, uh, because it seems like there are a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. Under, under the table, then we're, it feels a little weird at first, a little disconcerting. But in many of these cases, if, if I always say, if you have to create things the same way, 10 out of 10 times, why are you having to do that in the first place? Why can't your framework, why can't your libraries do a lot of that heavy lifting for you? If there's zero or very little variability, that stuff should be handled. So that's exactly what happens with the auto configuration. The things that happen repeatedly the same way are done for you. And if you need to overwrite that uh, and override that, typically you can add a property, you can create a bean and the auto configuration will back off. This is not a great example of this, by the way, but, uh, but it's sort of akin to uh, if we set our banner mode to off, that doesn't show the banner. Now that again is, is a very imprecise, it, it, isn't a, it isn't really auto configuration, it's in your startup, but it does follow the same type of pattern. You set a, pa you set a, a property, uh, and and things back off the auto configuration uh, or the the logic backs off and lets you do things the way you want to do. In 99% of the time, 99% of the cases, you simply don't have to do that. So I'm going to stop that, and we'll just comment this out. Now, I mentioned earlier that you have beans that are created, 485 in this case. I also mentioned that you have a lot of properties that are coming in. And, and we typically don't grab that context to show that. Is there a better way? Is there another way? Well, yes, there is. Uh, there's a way I'm going to go here to my IDE. Uh, whoops, the wrong, wrong one here. Uh, and we can set, uh, oh, actually the wrong place here. Again, we can set this in our IDE. So many, so many options. So we can check this box, enable debug output. That's unique or specific to IntelliJ. Uh, of course, we can also hide the banner here as well. Uh, we can also uh, set certain uh, indicators here to not, uh, to not show or to show, I should say, the auto configuration report with dash dash debug. What I like to do though, is just set it here because that way, regardless of your IDE, it works or you can pass in dash dash debug on the command line as well. But if we start this up, I'll go ahead and start the application again. And now if you're ever wondering why a certain bean is being created, why behavior is happening, why your bean that you specifically created or a property that you set isn't being taken into account, you can see this auto configuration report. Now, let me go up to the top here. And if you debug, set debug equal to true, you can see your con conditions evaluation report and here are the positive matches. So there are conditions that are checked. So if the property is defined, spring.aop.auto equals true, then AOP auto configuration will be performed, right? Uh, and, and everything goes conditional on class, conditional on property, conditional on available endpoint. Uh, and sometimes it looks for the absence of a property or what have you. So if in this case, I'll use this as an example, spring AOP auto equals true, now, is it really true? We didn't set that, but spring.aop auto, we see that the default value is true. So that will always happen 
unless we disable it, right? So uh, back to our report, we also not just have positive matches, but we have negative matches. So the active MQ auto configuration did not match. The conditional on class didn't find the required class. So this, this auto configuration wasn't performed. And that's why you have this long list that in most cases isn't, well, in, in nearly any case is, is not done because most of those things are evaluated and discounted because they don't have a match. Uh, you also have your unconditional, uh, I'll line up my fingers on the keys here, unconditional. Oh, unconditional, there we go, typing helps. And these auto configurations are done every time, right? They're just, they're done as a matter of course. So this is useful information to have. I'm going to go ahead and comment this out so it'll uh, not slow us down on our startups. But again, that's one way to check it that you don't have to go through and manually manipulate anything. You set a value. Now, going back to our code, uh, we have a component here. I'm just going to change this now to a REST controller, and we're going to uh, extend this a little bit. Now, REST controller, by doing that, what happens to our bean that we created with at component? Well, if I drill into REST controller, we see it's an alias for controller, which is an alias for component. <laughs> so it will still create a component for our something, right? So we'll still have a something component. Now I'm going to uh, just change this to, uh, let's see, we'll return a string, get something. And let's see, we'll return, um, hmm. Well, that's fine. This is something, yeah. Well, you know, let's let's take this a, a bit farther here. So, um, so let's see. Bean um, initializing bean, and let's add a bean name here. Right. So, where does bean name come from? Well, we'll create uh, a value here called bean name. We haven't assigned no value to it, so right now it'll be null. So let's just grab a value here. Uh, and I'm going to use a bit of a spring expression language here. So uh, bean dot name. So if we have a bean name defined anywhere, we will pull that in. Now, at this point, we don't. This will error out. So I'm going to just set a default bean name here to ABC. So if we start this, what we should get is uh, when we when we hit this, oh, I don't I haven't even defined an endpoint. So let's go back and do that. So at get mapping. Uh, that's fine. We'll just go to the uh, standard endpoint. So let's go ahead and restart that, the uh, root. So let's go here. And 8080. 80. Oh, that's kind of small, isn't it? Let's let's uh, expand that. All right. HTTP is what I use. We'll go here. We should see there we go. Initializing being ABC. So that's good. We have kind of a, if all else fails, plug in ABC for our bean name. And there we go. Now, uh, what I like to do, and this is kind of a really great way to, to show, hey, um, well, I, let me show you first what we can do to examine some of these things if we want to see behind the scenes. So if I go here and I go to localhost 8080, that's the application port that we're running on, and I go to actuator. Now, remember earlier I mentioned that actuator by default is pretty tightly uh, closed down, and that's by design. Now, you can secure endpoints. You can open them up uh, on a case-by-case -case basis using Spring Security. Uh, but by default, all that you can see is the health endpoint, which just says, is your application up or not, or a specific health endpoint, if we have one, which we don't. And then, of course, the self-referencing link here to get back right where we started, right here. Uh, so we want a little bit more. And, and as I go through this, what I want to do is open up everything. Again, this is not for production because you'll see a lot of information, a lot of very sensitive information, your class path, your environment, uh, your, your path, <laughs> everything on your, on your, on your underlying uh, machine that this is running on. And you don't typically want to do that because uh, if you don't secure those endpoints specifically, anybody can see that. And that means that the people you don't want to see that can also see that. So that's not necessarily a, a good thing. But for demos, this is a great thing because it lets us kind of explore everything without uh, without restriction. So we know that we're going to be getting uh, that uh, that first value if no other value is set. But I'm going to set um, bean name here equal to uh, X, Y, Z. And we're just going to restart. And we'll see what we get. 
So I'll restart the application and we're just going to, to hit that endpoint once again. And we should, wow, why did we get ABC? I wish there was some way that we could see uh, maybe where that value came from. Well, let's go back to our actuator and I'll refresh that. And now of course that I've opened up everything, we can see a lot more information health, info, conditions, config props, if we have any configuration properties, classes, uh, the full environment. This is a great example of why you don't want to expose this to everyone, because as you can see, there's a lot of very sensitive information here, information that we saw earlier with our context by grabbing the environment from it. Uh, but this is a nice presentation and it's much easier to do with a simple uh, addition of a library actuator. Uh, so you see a lot of information here. So I'm just going to go back to the top and we'll see if we can find our bean name. And we see our bean name is right there, uh, but wasn't it bean.name? Yeah, we're not seeing that at all. Now in this case, it's pretty easy, right? Because we know that there, there might be something amiss. We have literally one place we can look for it, uh, but we're looking for a value bean.name. And if we go back here and we fix that, that should fix the problem entirely. Now, before, because time is very tight and I don't want to run out of time, I'm going to go ahead and create a couple or three different uh, places that we can store this bean name. And I'll show you a really quick trick, uh, well, quick capability of Actuator that is, is a nice feature as well. Not just for the properties, but again, this is the easy way to show you this. Uh, so that's why I kind of gravitate to it because it, it's the uh, fastest way to get there. Uh, let's see. So uh, let's do a Maven clean package. I'm just going to uh, build this from the command line. And then I want to go into, and while that's doing that, uh, you know what, I kind of skipped ahead a little bit, but that's fine. What I'm going to do is, again, short circuit this because our time is so precious. I'm going to go ahead and create uh, uh, export um, bean, dot, uh, bean name equals and we'll say this is RST and we'll export our spring application JSON. And we're going to create just a little bit of JSON here. And we'll say bean.name quote colon. And let's say this was um, UVW and we'll close that. And then let's do a Java dash jar target target bot dash dash bean dot name equals um, let's say this is a CDE yeah let's do that all right so now we've got and and this is again this is a crazy simple example but what it's meant to simulate is that with your application you don't always know uh, where properties are coming in configuration uh, so we we looked at our configuration our uh, auto configuration report but now if we go here, um, let's see, uh, let's just open another window. There we go. And if I do this, what am I going to get? And where did it come from? Well, let's take a look at what we get. It's CDE. Now, where did that come from? We know the what, let's look at the why now. So if I go back to the top here, I just refresh my actuator environment endpoint. And if we go to the top and I search for bean.name, you can see right at the top, it's coming via command line arguments. The next one, should that not be there, the next one to, to be processed would have been the Spring Application JSON. After that, we can go down here to our config resource, class path resource, the application properties. And we can see even here uh, that it's showing exactly where it's coming from. So, uh, so we get a lot of different options in terms of where it's, it's showing up. And we, we see here, five, or excuse me, 11, 11. And if we go back to our application, we see line 11, column 11, that's exactly what it's reporting. So that's kind of useful information. Uh, Actuator gives you that and so much more. I just don't have time to dig into it. But again, Actuator many times exposes the why behind the what, which is why it's very useful, not just for environment variables, but for many other things as well. And you can create metrics, you can create your health endpoints, you can create a lot of information that's super useful for diving into further into your application. Now, Again, we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to go back and, and look at some of our Sleuth and Zipkin, the tracing information. So I'm going to change this to, instead of das Boot, we'll do a uh, backing boat or boot, <laughs> I guess in this case. So this is our second service we're going to be creating. I'm going to just spin this up and we'll drop that also on our desktop. We'll open that up. 
and it's just not wanting to, uh, oh, there we go. And I'm going to open that here and scoot that over here. And let's see, we'll open our application properties because we do want to set our server port equal to 8081 so we don't have a port conflict. I'm going to set the spring application name to, in this case, boot backing. And then we'll just do the same thing here for our Zipkin service name, that's fine. Don't necessarily need to worry about actuator for this part, so I'll just charge on. Uh, let's go ahead and create, or go in and do a little bit of code here. I'm just going to create a REST, REST controller, class backing controller, and we will create a, let's see, get mapping. Um, and we will have an endpoint here called reverse. And we will send back a string, reverse it. Again, very simple example. I'm going to have a request parameter here that we'll pass in, and this is our inbound string. And we will return a reverse string. And this is just as a, an example so we can see this happening uh, as we go. Again, nothing terribly complex by design. We just want to see what happens and why. So I'm going to return string buffer dot, oops, new string buffer uh, inbound. And we will take that, we will reverse it, and we will create a string and we'll just return that. Super simple, right? <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> now, I, I do want to do one other thing here because, um, Again, we're just going to uh, cut to the chase here. Now I'm going to create a string here. And then I want to create a second method that's gonna slow things down just a little bit. So I'm gonna say, uh, we'll just say, um, yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. So I'm gonna create a class here called sleeper. And this will be a component, right? So we know what that means. It's a bean that's gonna be created. And then I'm going to uh, have a method here. Uh, that we will just call um, public um, void sleep, sleep. And we'll just do a thread, just terrible, terrible. I sometimes tell people I try to uh, model best practices, except when I don't. This is one of those times, right? So I'm, I'm, this is not a best practice. It's just for the purposes of the demo. So this is a little crude. This is a little ugly. It's just for the purposes of the demo. So bear with me. So what I want to do is inject now private final sleeper, uh, sleeper, and we'll just make this a constructor parameter so we can use that. Come on, there we go. And we'll just say sleeper.sleep. Perfect. Now, uh, what I want to do in order to track this is to break this out because otherwise what happens, um, I'm going to have to extend this because string reverse it. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Return S. I couldn't see the uh, all the code because of the uh, the chat and the people over there. So I just had to scoot it over a bit. So so what I'm basically doing is I'm going to um, reverse it and add a little bit of a delay here and then come back. But I want to break this out so I can get visibility into to this. So I'm going to make this a new span. And we'll just call this Z <laughs> so we can see what's happening in Zipkin. So I'm going to go ahead and start this. And then I'm going to go back to my first application. And I'm going to create another endpoint here, get mapping. And we'll say uh, reverse, reverse. And we'll string this, get reverse, reverse, reverse text. And of course, we need some kind of a bean, some way to create a, a connection to this, right? So I'm going to create a web client bean. Client, client, uh, and we will return web client.create. We'll point to our other service, localhost in this case, 8081. And then we'll inject that bean here so we can use that. And let's see. So private final web client. And we will add that to a constructor, right? Nice. And now we can just do return client, client.get.uri, because we want to point this to 
reverse over on the other service. And we want to provide a parameter. In this case, it's inbound equals. And we want to say that that is um, inbound text. And I'm going to just uh, say the inbound text in this case is uh, this is my string. String. There we go. Again, not, uh, not terribly clever, but it works. And we're going to convert this to a mono in this case of type string. And we'll just block that. Again, very, very simple, very inelegant, but it should work. And we'll restart that. So now we have our two applications hopefully running. We also should have Zipkin running. I'm going to, oh, that didn't work so well. Oh, yes, I already have it running out in the, uh, 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 we can fix that. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and restart this. And we'll pull up Zipkin, localhost. I have that actually running in locally, 9411. And this will allow us, oh, I've zoomed that in too. Let's, let's, uh, let's zoom that back, run the query. We have nothing here just yet. So let's go ahead, not really. Um, so if I do an HTTP pi colon 8080 reverse, oh, and it works just as we'd expect it to, right? Things never go wrong in demos. So if I show this, we can see that we have das Boot here and it's calling reverse, which then calls our backing service, which then since we defined a new span, we can see exactly how long each part of each call is happening, is taking, which is critically important when you're talking about distributed systems because with distributed systems, and this is again, a very super simple example, but it's already looks very useful, right? You can see where the bulk of the time is being consumed. You can know where you need to go to troubleshoot any latency issues that you're seeing. Uh, if you have a very complex system that's pulling values from multiple different backing services, you can see how this would be super useful. We can also go into dependencies, which in this case is not terribly useful either because it's such a simple example, uh, but <laughs> which you just have the, the two services. But this makes a lot of sense when you, the more complex systems you create, the better information you can gather uh, to, to troubleshoot these and resolve these. So um, let's see, the remote debugging, I don't have time for. Um, you know what? Let's see if I can stop this. It's very simple to set up remote debugging. I'll show you how, I'm not sure I'll have time to execute it, but uh, you can go in here and create uh, another configuration. Let's see, cancel, I guess I just went into that. Edit configurations, there we go. And you add a configuration, remote JVM debug. These parameters are what you add to run it and debug remotely. And with that, I am out of time. So uh, again, it's very simply done. You execute uh, your, your remote uh, container, your remote application with this, and then you connect to it using this configuration you just created and everything connects as if you're running it locally on your machine. Super simple, super, uh, super useful. Now, let me go back and finish off the last slide. If you want to know more, please check out the repository. I don't have anything up there yet. I actually now, since I'm adding in the uh, Sleuth and Zipkin, I'm going to create the services and place them out there. So you should see them out there by the end of the week. Uh, but star and watch the repository so you get notified when that, when that drops. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please ping me on email or better yet on Twitter. And just thanks for coming to JCon. Thanks for letting me be a part of it. And hope to see you later today uh, for another session. Bye all.